Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really happy um, to be back on the island, and I hope you all had a chance to see the show at the museum. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, my style of sculpture, what I, what I make, but also to focus on the El Zodiaco Familiar, which is a collaborative uh, set of figures that are in the gallery now. Pursuing art is... Um, when you don't have a lot of examples of artists, it's a tricky thing to do. So um, for me, having that support network was really important. And you know, I told my mother, I'm gonna major in ceramics. And she was like, she was all about it. She's like, okay, just finish college. You got this. So um, I went to the University of Texas in El Paso. Again, that's where I grew up. That's kind of the school that I, um, knew that I was gonna like attend just because of, uh, I wanted to be close to family at that point in my life. <clears throat> and I took my first ceramics class in 2004. Uh, so 2004, this was my uh, intro to ceramics. Um, this is a self portrait. Um, it's me, uh, what I look like in uh, 2004, trying to, find, trying to find all the pieces. So, um, my work has always dealt with a lot of narrative, so I try and build these stories, and then um, once I have the story, then I'll make an object that um, hopefully contains that story. I moved to the University of Washington in Seattle in 2007, and that was for graduate school. <clears throat> so once I decided and I told my mother, okay, I'm doing ceramic, like I'm gonna get a degree in ceramics, I also decided uh, for me, that I wanted to pursue an MFA. Uh, and an MFA meant that uh, I could potentially go on to teach higher education, or I could just have like that focus of really honing in uh, my craft. This is the first piece that I made at the University of Washington. And I went there because I studied with Akio Takamori, who's like great friend, uh, amazing artist. Uh, Doug Jack, who was another phenomenal figurative artist, and Jamie Walker. So that trio kind of rounded out the, um, my influence at the University of Washington. <clears throat> and I came in feeling a little bit, um, how can I say it? Like, not, not as confident in my education, like my overall education. The other, my other colleagues had a lot of uh, world experience. They'd lived, you know, in New York, went to some like really great schools. Um, I came from El Paso, I had a very small community of people, but I felt really confident in my building skills. Like I knew that I was a maker and I could make things. So University of Washington had a big kiln, uh, a kiln large enough for me to stand in, and I took it as a challenge like, okay, I need to build, my first piece needs to be um, big enough to fill that kiln, uh, which was this uh, matador and bull. And that's the time when I started this like ornamental decorative uh, technique that I've been using. Uh, and the initial one for this matador was to mimic embroidery. So I wanted a way to um, you know, get that beautiful like texture of the uh, traje de luces, that embroidered uh, outfit. So I started making little molds and clay sprigs and then applying them to, to the surface. <clears throat> and for this piece, I incorporated fiber in the tassels and there's always a little bit of humor in my work, or at least I try to include some humor. So uh, this is the Chicago Bulls because I was uh, raised, raised with the Michael Jordan dynasty. Um, and that's uh, an image of uh, the scale of the work. And the arms, you know, just technically were, were built separate um, because of the weight. So they were like sleeve and socketed back in after, after firing. So, you know, I, I'm skipping through a lot, but I went through my graduate studies. <clears throat> I did a whirlwind travel um, for about a year. I went to about 26 countries in a year, thanks to a fellowship through the University of Washington. Um, and during that time, I was in a group show at Foster White Gallery. I gave them three pieces, then I left to travel. They sold two of those three pieces. Um, and they asked me if I wanted to uh, work with them. So I've had a relationship with Foster White Gallery since 2011, when my first solo show was. And I actually have a show opening with them this coming Thursday. So I'll extend my stay in, uh, in Seattle till Sunday of next week. <clears throat> 
And my first show at Foster White was, um, you know, I was kind of nervous. I'm like, what do I, what do I do? It's my first solo show ever. Um, so I went back to kind of that first piece that I made in grad school, the self-portrait. <clears throat> and for me, the self-portrait was this way, like this, almost like a defense mechanism. I made myself because people couldn't tell me that I was doing something wrong, right? Like, uh, if it's me, then I should be um, kind of the authority on myself. So this is um, Rodriguez with flowers, which is me with this new decorative technique that I really loved. Um, and then subsequently, I made about 12 other uh, busts, and they were all these other Georges. So George Washington, Curious George, um, George Clinton, um, George Sand. So I really try and kind of like diversify all these different uh, Georges. <clears throat> In 20, what was it, 2016, I made a series of figure called the Sanctuary Series. Uh, and there's one of those figures in the show. It's the Battle Ready. It's um, a trans figure with kind of military uh, outfit. Um, so I started making all these figures that, you know, I, I, up until that time, I was still incorporating a lot of self-portraits, and there would always be like one self-portrait in the span of a show. Um, but in 2016, I really started to just look at my community and figure out like who, who in my community also needs to be kind of put literally like placed on a pedestal. And the first self-portrait when I was thinking of the Sanctuary series in uh, 2016 uh, was this, you know, State of the Union. So it was my, uh, my feelings and my thoughts around the 2016 presidential election. So uh, these were kind of like my emotions as I was uh, going through that. Um, and behind you can see the, uh, behind the Uncle Sam and uh, Tia Katrina, you can see the series of uh, sanctuary figures. So there was about, I don't know, like eight or nine uh, that, diff that represented different people in my uh, community. And Uncle Sam and Tia Katrina were um, our me, but are also the border city where I grew up. So this was presented at the University of Texas in El Paso, uh, my undergrad university. Um, and I, you know, I first showed just those figures here in Seattle at Foster White. Then I had the opportunity to work with the museum at UTEP. Um, so I decided I'm, I'm going to make a large Uncle Sam and a large um, Tia Katrina as these guardians that protect the space that are both very different but um, equal, right? Like in coloration, um, they couldn't feel more different, but they stand the same height, they stand in the same place, and they kind of like you know, allow people into the space. A few other pieces, um, an altar, which is a piece on my right, is a series of uh, four columns on the bottom, which represent um, like the four directions or uh, four elements, water, wind, water, uh, earth, water, wind, fire, earth, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm like, there's water twice. I'm, I'm back on the island. Um, so, uh, and then above that is uh, primal. So there's a wolf and a lion. So it's this duality, but also this kind of primal nature. The dome above that is um, faith and death. So there's a skull, and then there's this kind of like um, saintly figure or face. And then the crown over the top is um, us, us people, right? Um, so. For me, this altar is just an altar for anybody, for everything that you like. Um, and I placed us at the top, but we are, um, you know, very visible, but only because we have this foundation underneath us. Otherwise, if you take that crown off and you put it on the ground, you don't, you know, so small you won't even see it. Um, Mexican American Gothic is a play on um, Grant Wood's American Gothic. Um, I was raised by my mother, so I put the matriarch figure kind of in the foreground. Um, and that piece is now at the Renwick uh, with the Smithsonian Gallery. Um, the, an altar is part of the permanent collection of uh, UTEP, so they put it in one of their new buildings. And Seven Indulgences is a self-portrait, um, which is a face in the front with these other seven heads that are connected to the vessel. Um, and those are kind of like the seven, seven sins. And that piece um, is now at the uh, National Museum in Stockholm, which I was just there like 
five days ago for, for the opening of that exhibit. <clears throat> and then the piece that has kind of taken a lot of my energy in the last year was this um, series of nine musicians uh, titled Let the Music Take You. And Kansas City just built a brand new terminal and I was lucky enough to receive one of the uh, percentages for the arts. So these are uh, nine traveling musicians. They're all jazz musicians. Um, they have their instruments in cases because they're on the go. And uh, the decoration on their body, uh, all of the sprigs, have to do with Kansas City, um, icons of Kansas City, whether it's barbecue to the Negro Leagues Museum, to the Art Institute, um, to indigenous cultures. And those were all made um, at the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, where I was teaching for the uh, past three years. How long did it take you to do that? So I, uh, the whole commission was about 18 months. Um, and it took about a year to build the figures, you know, with um, building and firing and all of that, that whole process. Um, <clears throat> so to get into um, some of the heads, the animal heads that are at, um, in the gallery, in the atrium gallery, those heads were based on Ai Weiwei's uh, circle of animals. So I had the opportunity first to like see those in a book and I just like loved the story of the um, Chinese zodiac and the whole uh, great race and how all the animals were, uh, were aligned from the first through the 12th. If you don't know that story, you should definitely look it up. Um, <clears throat> but it's just this like really whimsical, fun story. And then I um, saw these Ai Weiwei sculptures and they're just phenomenal, you know? And for me, it really is a story about uh, community and people. So we, uh, we all are placed in a year um, when we're born. So depending on your year of birth, um, uh, the year of the dog. So, you know, that, that was given to me. I didn't get to choose it. Um, but now I get to adopt things that I enjoy about it and things that I don't enjoy, I can kind of just like <laughs> push down, right? Um, so at first I made... Um, I wanted to pay homage to the original 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac, so I made these vases, these decorative vases, um, that have all those 12 animals. And they all start with the same uh, general human face, and then they change into these um, animal forms. So they're, they're relative in uh, scale. So year of, the rat, uh, year of the snake, year of the dragon. Uh, we're currently in the year of the rabbit. Um, and then I thought, well, I want to create these larger heads, um, but I want to bring them a little bit closer to home. So instead of um, the year of the dragon, it would be El Año del Quetzalcoatl. And a Quetzalcoatl is a uh, feathered serpent. So um, there's no dragon in Mexican mythology, but there is a flying feathered serpent, right? <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to kind of do, do that pairing. Um, instead of the year of the rat, it'd be El Año del Chapulín, so the grasshopper. Uh, and I tried to kind of pair it with different attributes that I thought would uh, match, up, match up well. So instead of it being the year of the rabbit uh, this year in the zodiac that I created, um, it would be El Año del Cacomixel. And a Cacomixel is a ring-tailed cat kind of found in the, um, in the desert. So I first made uh, a set of 12 of these animals for the Seattle Art Fair in 2018. Uh, and that's the first time that they were uh, displayed for people to see. So I paired them up, you know, the 12 Mexican uh, zodiac animals and then the 12 uh, Chinese zodiac vases. Um, and that's me with uh, my gallerist, Fen Huang, who uh, runs Foster White Gallery, owns Foster White Gallery, and a couple of her employees. Um, and, you know, when I first started with them in 2011, um, I was so intimidated by the gallery, the gallerists, the people walking in, like every, everybody. Um, but seven years later at this point, and now um, 12 years, 13 years later, um, you know, they're, they feel like family, which is really a lovely place to be. So the idea with these 12 um, Zodiac animals was always to make five different series of them because I wanted to, you know, kind of explore different versions of these Zodiacs and what they would look like. So the first one was just like the style that I um, love to decorate my work with, right? Very ornamental, uh, colorful. The second one <clears throat> was similar, but it was based on the alebrijes, which are these small wooden um, animals usually found in Oaxaca in Mexico. 
So the coloration for those were based on the alebrijes, and these are located at the computer science building at the University of Washington. Um, one of the computer science buildings, I don't remember which one. <laughs> um, the third version was uh, an homage to Ai Weiwei's originals, so they were um, clay pieces, but glazed in a bronze glaze so that they would feel and look like they were metal. Um, and these are in a private collection in Montana. Um, the fourth version, um, I haven't quite figured out and gotten right yet, but they're based on Talavera pottery. So instead of um, adding the ornamentation, I'm drawing the ornamentation. It just hasn't looked uh, the right way yet. So fourth version is still in progress. But during the uh, height of the pandemic, I kind of skipped ahead to the fifth version, which is a version that's at the museum now, El Zodiaco Familiar. And I was really excited about this version because it not only was um, me working on these figures, but I always knew that I would uh, bring in collaborators. I gave myself certain rules in order to make this possible, right? So all the artists identify as Mexican or Chicane, born of Mexican descent. Um, all the artists were born the year of their animal. And then um, they didn't have to work with clay necessarily. So it was just artists that I admired who um, had a diverse background in like, disciplines. I first started by asking my friends, right? So I asked a couple of my friends um, and they hopped on. So I had like four people at that point. And then they referred other people that I should look at. And if I liked the work, then I would reach out and, and say, um, hey, do you want to collaborate? But only if you're born on these, on these years, uh, <laughs> which was uh, kind of tricky. Uh, so then I got, you know, maybe about eight uh, people. And then the other four people, like I just, Instagram or research on Google. Like I knew that I wanted somebody who did poetry to be part of this project. So I just looked up online um, for Mexican poets that were living um, and Cole, Cole um, emailed some folks and the same thing. If they were, um, if they were born a year that was already taken, I would you know, apologize and say like, let's collaborate on something different, but then I would have to like move on. Um, <laughs> Which was, um, for me, a really, I don't know, it was tricky. It was, uh, uh, it, was, it, was hard. it was hard to do. It was a really difficult uh, project. So um, Moises Salazar um, lives in Chicago. And Moises, um, I knew initially from the clay world. So Moises, I believe, went to the Art Institute of Chicago working in ceramics. So I already knew about their work. <clears throat> and as it happens when you're in school, your work evolves, your work changes, you're challenged. Um, so Moises started to make work that um, they say was a little bit more true and really talks about their um, queer identity, bringing masculinity to more traditionally uh, feminine colors. So he has some like baptismal sets. He has some uh, tufted paintings, uh, a lot of glitter in their work. When Moises and I started working together, um, they were in Chicago. Um, they weren't able to travel to Seattle to work on the piece, so we just discussed, like, well, what is it going to look like? And we decided the background should be pink, so I made the form, uh, painted it pink. It needs to have a few holes along the edges. Um, and then I completely just, like, fired that, packed it up, and shipped it to Chicago. And then we had very little communication in between, and eventually it showed back up to my studio in Seattle uh, right, before, right before the show uh, with a little extra glitter in case some of it uh, came off, right? Uh, which, is, which is great. <clears throat> and every unpacking was just like a, you know, I'd seen images of the pieces, but I hadn't uh, seen them in person until um, the very first showing of this work. You know, and I'm giving you like the smallest snippet of these people. So I would, if you see somebody that you like, uh, whose work you love, I would please uh, look them up. They're all, they're all really wonderful. Um, and Marilyn Montufar is um, another one of those people. Marilyn uh, splits her time between Seattle, New York, and Los Angeles. Um, and we initially met teaching at a teen arts um, camp for Gage Academy in Seattle. Marilyn shoots portraits of people uh, in different, you know, different marginalized groups or um, 
unrepresented uh, people, so migrant workers, um, et cetera. Maryland is uh, the year of the, of the bull. So when we first started talking, we realized that we had a connection to my hometown, to El Paso. Maryland's uh, grandmother uh, spent time in El Paso, so she wanted to focus on that story. Uh, and my thought, you know, I always came into these collaborations knowing the artists already. So I'm like, Maryland's going to, you know, do photographic collage. And that's what the bull's going to look like. But of course, when you're actually collaborating, it just completely changes. So she wanted to add um, Aztec symbolism to the work. So some of the ornamentation that you see are these, um, uh, these different Aztec symbols that represent different flowers. <clears throat> Uh, because we were focusing on El Paso um, and Ciudad Juarez, which is right across the border, we wanted to create a borderline on the bull and kind of split it in two. So that's that center, that center kind of like uh, river that snakes through the middle. Um, the, there, there was some photo collage, and the photos are images that she took, images that she found. Her grandmother is featured in, that, um, in the photo of the, of the bull, and then my mother as well. Um, and <clears throat> this piece, we knew that we wanted glass horns because the bull is this like very powerful, strong uh, animal, but we wanted these glass horns to bring a little fragility uh, to the work as well. A recollections that atravesando con el toro means like, um, the, you know, our recollections of crossing with the bull. So like it's about moving from, um, from Mexico to the States. Um, Alejandra Carrillo Estrada is an artist, a jeweler from El Paso, Texas, from my hometown. So we met briefly when I was an undergrad, but uh, we actually reconnected um, in Philadelphia for a, a craft conference. The first month that I moved to Philadelphia, she showed up for this craft conference, and we found out we were both from El Paso, and there was this like instant like... What restaurant did you go to? What school did you go to? You know, like the whole small town-ish. Um, so um, uh, Ale now teaches at UTEP in the metals department, and she does a lot of, um, like, retail jewelry. So she'll do a lot of craft shows um, and small objects like those luchador rings and cufflings and earrings and things like that for, for sale. But she'll also uh, create these, like, larger time-intensive uh, metal installations as well. So with, um, with Ale, she knew that um, she wanted to incorporate some jewelry. So she thought about the chola motif um, and wanted to bring that to, to the Jaguar. And chola is this kind of a aesthetic, like, um, you know, big hoop earrings, dark eyeliner. And we really wanted to bling out the, um, the Jaguar. So what I did with Ale was um, she couldn't travel initially to... Seattle to prep everything. Um, so I made a paper mache of the form, send that to her so that she could um, plan out these um, golden whiskers and big hoops and, uh, soap and bandana. So I worked on the majority of the clay work in Seattle. Ale worked on all of the jewelry in El Paso and sent it out to get gold plated. And then it all joined back together in Seattle to, to uh, fit. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, making Brava Nepalta, which is the two um, uh, words that are in the hoop earrings. Uh, Samira Steinmeier is from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and Samira is, I, I never met Samira. I, we finally met last year in Sacramento for a, a clay conference. But before that, we had never met. But I knew some, uh, Samira's pottery. Samira's a really uh, prolific, wonderful potter uh, with a big, like, Instagram following. So her pots are very, like, um, coveted by a lot of people because they're beautiful and, like, extremely well made. Um, but she does a lot of um, southwest landscape around Arizona. So she'll sometimes go out and uh, grab some soil from the surrounding canyons and include that into her pieces. I wasn't able to make the form myself, right? Because the, the substructure would be marbled clay. So what I did is instead I, I made a PDF and I made a mold and I taught Samita how to use this mold to basically make the piece herself. And I packed this mold up with the PDF 
which was digitally, which I did not pack. Um, <laughs> and then I sent that to her, to uh, Tucson. And she basically, um, you know, I never physically made any of the, of, I, I didn't make any of the physical work that you see in the show for Samira's piece. Um, I just created the mold. Um, and what, you, what you're seeing in the show is actually the, um, the second piece. The first one, apparently, the, the marbling wasn't exactly where she wanted it. You know, and it makes sense. It's the first time that she's worked in that scale because most of her work is at a, a pottery scale. Um, and a lot of people ask about the eyes, and the eyes are just glaze, right? They're not, um, they're just like glaze, fired on glaze. Josimar Reyes is one of those people that I just found online. Uh, I wanted to work with a poet. Um, I knew that, you know, I, I was curious. I felt very comfortable in my ceramic uh, abilities, but I wanted to share that with people, but also be challenged. And I thought, you know, it'd be great to incorporate um, poetry. And when we first started talking about um, what this collaboration would look like, <clears throat> You should look at some of Josimar's uh, videos online. They're really powerful when he uh, speaks um, his poems. But he wanted to bring his grandmother into uh, the project. So what he did is he created this, um, he wrote this poem um, that taught her how to basically re recite this poem. Um, I can't remember her exact age. I believe she's in her 90s at this point. She practiced over and over reciting. Uh, and he eventually took that and made an audio file with, uh, with some birds in the background. And the title of the poem and of the piece is called Guerrero. And Guerrero is the, uh, the state where his grandmother grew up in Mexico. But it also means uh, warrior uh, as a translation. So we uh, took some of the words from the poem, incorporated that onto the Quetzalcoatl face, and then... Um, his grandmother's voice is coming through through the speaker in the mouth. So Josimar has never seen this the physical object. He only worked on the audio file and then sent that over. So he has yet to see uh, the, the piece. Again, you know, all these artists are in different, different areas. Um, Eric Garcia. Eric Garcia lives in Minneapolis. <clears throat> I first met Eric in Chicago at an art fair, he and his wife. Uh, and Eric is an illustrator and political cartoonist. He talks a lot about uh, himself, but also um, Mexican culture um, and kind of uh, politics around the, around the states and in Mexico. When um, Eric and I first started working, they had just had a baby, a uh, brand, new, brand new baby, didn't feel comfortable traveling to Seattle as well. So uh, we sat down and uh, he drew some sketches. What he really wanted was um, the U.S.-Mexico border on the dulap of the iguana. So you can kind of see it traced out uh, on the bottom there. And he wanted a little bit more space on the top crest as well to have more drawing uh, space. So I just made the form to those um, specifications. No color, no anything. Send it to Minneapolis. and. Eric did all of the illustration with acrylic um, over the surface. So um, he used green because of the, you know, the natural color of the iguana, but then brought a lot of imagery. Um, 1977 is the year he was born. It's a self-portrait talking about being a colonizer himself and also being colonized. So living in this like duality as a, as a person uh, here in the States. Christy Tirado. Christy lives in the Yakima Valley in Washington State. <clears throat> and Christy is a printmaker, um, wood carving and uh, linoleum. Uh, I needed to do that, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and I first met Christy in uh, Ellensburg, Washington, where we first, uh, where we showed together uh, at Gallery One in Ellensburg. Um, but funny story about Christy is that Right out of grad school, I needed a job, and I had to. I wanted to do something in the ceramics world, so I went to a paint-your-own-pottery shop to load their kilns uh, in uh, University Village in Seattle. And <clears throat> Christy had worked there like the the year previous to me arriving, uh, which we never met there, but we kind of you know were on a similar path. This is some of Christy's work. So again, a lot of printmaking. Um, uh, wood cuts and linoleum cuts depicting some of the um, migrant workers around the Yakima Valley, a self-portrait in the center that I believe is a 
digital painting, uh, and then some other printmaking um, as well. So when Christy wanted to collaborate, we went through a whole different, uh, a lot of iterations, but ceramics lends itself really well to kind of mimic that uh, linoleum cutting with graffito. So we just put a substrate of black um, slip over the top of the burro, uh, and Christy came to my studio in um, Seattle. I was in, in town at that point. My assistant Liz was helping her. Uh, so I didn't see Christy at all as she came in to just like carve the piece, left it there, and then we fired, uh, we fired it for her. Um, but it's a really, you know, simple process, but very uh, detailed and labor intensive uh, work as well. Carolina Jimenez. Carolina lives in Brooklyn. Um, and I met Carolina, friend of a friend recommended me. Uh, Carolina works in fibers. I looked at her website. It was um, minimal, but I, but she really kind of like expressed her love for weaving. And I thought, you know, I like the color palette. I um, would love to incorporate some sort of weaving or fiber into this project as well, bring a little softness. <clears throat> a lot of the time with the ornamentation that I'm using, people think that it looks like uh, quilting. So it's, it already has this feel of, um, of fabric. So I really wanted to bring somebody who, um, who could work in uh, textiles. So with Carolina, what I did is I made a small mock-up of what the venado was going to look like, what the deer was going to look like. Uh, and then I shipped that to her so that she could play and just figure out what the technique was that she wanted to utilize on the larger scale. And then uh, I started to make the, the larger piece. Uh, adding, she really wanted me to add some of the sprig ornamentation to incorporate with the, with the textile. Um, and she wanted the ears to be completely uh, open so that she could treat it as a loom as well. So what ended up coming together was Venada Azul de los Cielos Claros, uh, Blue Deer of the um, Clear Skies. I shipped this to Philadelphia and then drove it to New York, dropped it off. Uh, and that's the first time that I met uh, Carolina in person. Um, the horns are all just yarn strung together. So there's no like, you know, other structure besides just like tightly wound uh, yarn. So that makes it hold itself up. Which when she told me that, I was like, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> um, Gabriela Ramirez Mitchell is the only person living in um, Mexico. So she lives in Jalisco. Um, and Gabriela is a jeweler, uh, performance artist. She makes really funky, weird stuff, and I was like really drawn to it. A lot of um, a lot of play with raw clay. So I was like, "What is Gabriela going like? What crazy thing is Gabriela going to bring to this project?" And when we first started communication, um, she wasn't able to travel to the states, so. Um, I decided, okay, I'll just make the piece and I'll ship it to Mexico and then she'll work on it. <clears throat> and what Gabriela ended up doing was going with a very traditional technique of the Huichol people. She does a lot of spiritual uh, practices with the indigenous people in Mexico. So what she wanted to do was this yarn painting. So she then gathered some wax, covered the entire form in a wax, and then started painting with string. So all of the image or all of the color is just colored string that's been uh, placed on this uh, wax substrate. Um, and then she made the earrings to then uh, apply to the form. So Gabriela was really great at sending, setting me, sending me all these um, updated pictures uh, and images of like the progress. And it's just like so time intensive again, you know, to outline the, um, there's an ear of corn on one side, there's a blue deer on the other, there's a peyote flower kind of over, over the top. Um, so all of this like spiritual uh, symbolism. John Gomez is a, a tattoo artist and uh, illustrator from uh, Los Angeles, currently living in Brooklyn. John and I met at a summer camp in Sitka, Alaska. We were uh, both teaching there, not attending. Uh, so, um, so John was one of the first people that came onto the project. <clears throat> and, you know, I thought, well, tattoo and this kind of like very graphic um, illustration. I wonder what that, what that can look like. Um, so John actually was able to come to my studio in Seattle. And this was January of 2021. Uh, so we kind of like... Uh, 
we bubbled together, John and Gustavo, who you'll see a little later, and us three came to Seattle, spent about 10 days there, um, and just worked on these pieces uh, in person together. So it was very like joyous and com you know, community uh, oriented. But he, what he wanted to do was I taught him how to make those sprig molds, <clears throat> and he wanted to use traditional Chicano tattoo motifs to apply to the surface of this, um, of this eagle. So he used uh, the spider web and the rose and the skulls, um, and he wanted it to have this kind of like, you know, like more industrial uh, feel to it. So what ended up happening was um, this aguila with these uh, Chicano tattoo motifs over the surface. I talked a little bit about saying, telling friends like, oh, you can't, you're, you're born that year, it's already taken, you can't, can't do it. Um, Javier Barbosa is also the aguila. <laughs> Uh, so Javier, I also know from uh, Sitka, Alaska. He's an animator, so he's worked on you know like um, stuff for like Cartoon Network and uh, Netflix and like big animations. Um, and I asked John and Javier to collaborate at the same time, not knowing that they were both the same age, right? Um, so I was like, okay, we can make it work. You you two are friends. You know, I'm I'm a friend. All three of us can work together. So initially, it was going to be a big drawing behind uh, the Aguila. But what ended up happening is um, Javier was really interested in um, AR, so digital um, alternative reality, um, imposing images onto, onto the work. So what he started working on was these wings called Blood and Oil. And it's these wings that are an uh, Instagram filter. So he just created an Instagram filter the first time that he had worked with that uh, to scan the piece. And then when you scan it on your phone, these wings would come up and uh, would move. And I don't have the, the animation of them moving, but they're basically like moving up and down and they're covered in uh, blood and oil. Gabriel Marquez was born in El Paso. We are the same age, uh, Gabriel and myself. Um, I didn't meet Gabriel until, uh, I met Gabriel in Seattle at a function because he was living there as a muralist uh, for a while. He's back in El Paso now and started this wonderful um, gallery and um, event space. But um, you, can, you can see some of Gabriel's um, work in, um, in Seattle, like along the Sound Transit light rail stations uh, down in Soto. I think that one in the, on your left was at the Seattle Center. I haven't been down there. It, I know that was temporary while they were doing some construction. So it's probably not there anymore. But Gabriel was actually the first person who um, finished uh, the piece. He finished in November of 2020. Um, and he came, uh, he and his uh, partner and daughter came to my studio in Seattle. And we spent about seven days together. And he hadn't really worked with clay, but was very interested. So we just sat down, rolled all these coils, and he painted with, uh, with clay on the, on the pieces. What he ended up making was um, Espiritu del Viento, which is the spirit of the wind. Uh, El Paso is known as a windy city as well. So on the Chihuahua, there's like a tattered ear that's starting to uh, unravel a little bit. And he wanted to have all this, all this movement. Um, and then... Uh, last slide is Gustavo Martinez. Gustavo and I have been friends for a really, really long time. Uh, he went to University of Washington for grad school. Uh, he came to visit the program while I was in my second year there. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't study together, but we've been friends. Uh, Gustavo is kind of like holistic, makes a lot of like spiritual um, based guardians. He actually has a show in Seattle uh, this month as well at Art Exchange Gallery, uh, which I'm excited to see. Uh, and I'm excited to see Gustavo. But uh, he came with uh, John Gomez to work uh, in the studio together. <clears throat> and Gustavo is a clay artist. So he, I just like said, what do you need? Uh, and he said, just give me some clay. And then I kind of like left, left him alone. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, so he started to just like work, work on his own. And he has a much looser way of working. Um, and incorporating different clay bodies onto the, the work. So you can see, you know, that kind of uh, lighter tone that I made the initial form. And then he took a red clay and started to incorporate that on top of the surface to give it some contrast. Um, and what he ended up making was uh, cabra, cabron, cabrona, 
which is kind of a play, a play on words, cabra meaning goat, uh, cabron and cabrona mean like, kind of like asshole or like, <laughs> you know, but, but in a friendly way. Uh, so, uh, you know, you would say that to somebody you like, you would also say it to somebody you really don't like. So it has a play on that and also just um, more non-traditional religious um, imagery uh, behind it as well. This project again started in, um, in 2020 because I had time to spend some time on like email and contact and search and work with everybody. Um, and it was, it, it made, um, it made that year like tolerable uh, for me, right? So uh, I always thank the collaborating artists for wanting to, wanting to play and wanting to work together. Liz Wiegen, uh, Wiggy, uh, who's been working with me for many, many years, six, seven years now in my studio. Uh, she was a big help because when I was out of town, she was uh, also coordinating with some of these artists. And then the Waka Museum in Bellingham, because they, um, they took the work before it even being done, right? So they kind of took a chance on, on us finishing this work, which also was a good motivator for all of the artists saying like, we have a show, we gotta get it done. We can't like, you know, you can't just keep um, changing our minds all the time. Um, great, thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.